I, I, my, my, I, at the front of my mind was not to understand the Bible and, and really read it for what it said. Right. I had done my time yeah. of picking up my Didat books and my other yeah. books and picking and choosing the <laughs> verses. <laughs> right. But I had finally come to the decision that I was going to read this thing mm. to understand it, okay. believing there were already holes in it, ah. and they would have become self-evident to me. Okay. But upon reading this verse in Luke, in Luke 3, um, what stuck out to me was that it's not important what you were born. Yeah. It's important what is true. Mm -hmm. So Abraham was telling them, your lineage as a Jew, as a child of Abraham, will not save you. Right. Truth saves you. Right. Now, looking back on it, I think it was God drawing me. Mm. For this to jump out at me and say this, say this to me, Abdul, you've been so concerned mm -hmm. with showing how other people are wrong. Yeah. How do you know you're right? Oh. And my mind changed Ooh. about how to read the scripture all of a sudden. Oh. I began to read it a little differently and say, you know what? You. Well, exactly. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I think we, we, we lack often, whether we're a Christian, mm. uh, a nominal Christian, mm. someone who takes our Christianity not so seriously, yeah. is that we don't actually approach anything with an open mind. Right. And th these verses leapt out at me. Mm. These, are, these, these are actually condemning verses. These are harsh to read. They're hard to read. Yes. And I had a hard time reading them. Mm. But in some sense, my, my mind was liberated. Yeah. It was freed from, not totally, yeah. it was on the road toward being free oh. from uh, a narrow-minded view of uh, belief. Right. And uh, heritage was more important than truth, actually. And I yes. began to see that. I began yes. to see it. Mm. Well, as I began to study uh, uh, the Bible, mm. um, I began to read my Quran a little differently, too. Okay. And this is one of the things I think is important to understand. Many Muslims won't read the Bible mm. to understand it because of the danger that exists of what ha of happening what happened to me yes mm -hmm. you know god's word says that it, it will not return unfruitful they're not, afraid not of it, aren't void. They, in some cases and and uh, rightfully so yeah i'll tell you that because it has power in and of itself um in and of itself it has power and i believe any two-edged sword absolutely now i believe in all the and evidence was a big deal to me yeah. uh, i'm i'm a thomist yeah i can't come to faith in any way um i didn't come to faith in any way simply uh, tell me the gospel, I'll believe it, and I'll yeah. sign on. Yeah. Uh, for those who, who can do that, God bless them. Uh, I didn't, that wasn't me. Right. I needed to be hit over the head with a hammer, <laughs> uh, the hammer of evidence. And I, thankfully... He's got one. He's got, he's got, he's got, he's got a big one. <laughs> Praise um, the Lord. <laughs> so uh, I began to read the Quran a little differently, too. And um, I came across a verse that I had read 50 times mm. before that. And... Uh, it's um, in the Quran. It's found in uh, Al Maidah, uh, uh, which is just, uh, the fifth chapter, yes. verse forty-seven, mm -hmm. and it says, "Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed therein, they are no better than those who rebel." Hmm. And some some translations are actually a little bit more harsh about those who don't believe what God has revealed. Right. Now, what struck me about this verse for mm -hmm. the very first time, having read it 50 times, is the verbs are all present tense mm. in Arabic. Yes. I read it in Arabic, I read it in English, and I see that it's what God has revealed in the gospel. Yes. Let the people of the book judge mm -hmm. by that book that he has revealed. And they and it says specifically here in Arabic, Anjil, and it's gospel. Mm -hmm. And that's not just like uh, Ahl al-Kitab, people of the book. This is specifically. That's exactly right. That's the exactly gospel. the point. Yeah. Is that this one? There are other places here. We're yeah. talking about people of the book, and yeah. and it sort of. Uh, I, I won't say it's ambiguous. Right. It's not ambiguous, but it is um, more general. This is specific. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I'm also all of a sudden faced with a dilemma. Mm. Because in 7th century Saudi Arabia, when these words were spoken, God is telling, his, t telling the people of the gospel to judge by what God has revealed in the gospel. Mm. How can they do that if that book is corrupt? There this, must have been one existing at that time, right? Now, that's the point. The point is, is that if you look to 
um, the, the, the moment of the question of when, yes. when was it corrupted? Yes. Um, and that's one of the things that started All of a sudden, on. this matters more. Ah. Now, I know that there are people who debate whether or not this means what, it, what, I, what this translation yeah. and every other translation yeah. says. Right. says. Right. Um, but I began a study. The point wasn't whether or not it actually refers to the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I believe it does. Yes. Um, yes. The point was, it started me to look into whether the gospel I have today is the same gospel that existed in the seventh century, mm -hmm. in its various forms sort of spread out in Saudi Arabia. Right. Because if it is, then what's he referring to? Yeah. I, as a Muslim, do not believe that God speaks nonsense. Yeah. He wouldn't ask them to go to a corrupt book. Yes. If there's any evidence that the book I have today is the only book available that would make any sense to a, to a, Christ, to, mm -hmm. to a, to a people, to a person of the gospel. Right to look at, then I have an evidentiary problem. I have a problem. I have to either reconform what I think about Islam mm -hmm. or try to make this, the, 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 the Bible and the Quran mixed together. Right. But you see, the dilemma there is, is for me, was huge. Right. I had built up an identity yes. as someone who was um, a defender of Islam, as someone who was a... Uh, a preacher of Islam, I, I in my, within myself, was very proud of who I was as a Muslim. Yes. And so I'm faced with this possible identity suicide. Yeah. I've got to die to myself, so right. to speak. And Where'd you get that language? That, well, and, and here, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and I think part of that is the conviction that happens there. I didn't remember that language. Yeah. It was just something within me. Abdul, I want to stop you just for a moment to make sure that our listeners are following your logic. I think I am, but I want to convey that to them because this is such an important apologetic for the Christian faith. What you're saying, and stop me if I'm, I'm wrong, you're saying that in the Quran, in Islam, uh, there, there is plenty of evidence, especially here and other places, that Muhammad, that supposedly Allah through the angel Jabril to Muhammad, says to the Ahl al-Kitab, and in this case the people of the Anjil, right. definitely Christians, to read and to follow their book, because in that book there is guidance and light, therefore Muhammad himself puts the seal of approval on the authenticity of the Christian New Testament at the time that he was alive. Now, uh, is, that, is that what you're saying? Basically, yes. I mean, he wouldn't tell them to go to a book he knew to be corrupt mm -hmm. um, uh, and say that God has revealed that same book. Okay, now, we don't want to interrupt your testimony much longer, but David, you wanted to chime in. Yes, I just wanted to point out that uh, this point that, that the both of you are referring to, uh, my friend Sam Shamoon calls this the Islamic dilemma. Mm. A dilemma is where you're stuck with only two options and both of them cause a problem. Because if Muhammad is telling people to go to this book and that this book is inspired, there are only two possibilities. One is that the Bible is really inspired. If the Bible is really the inspired word of God, then Jesus Christ died on the cross for sins rose from the dead and claimed to be God. If those things are true, then Muhammad was a false prophet because he rejected all of these. So that's one possibility. The Bible is true, in which case Muhammad was a false prophet. The other alternative is that the Bible is not inspired. If that's the case, then Muhammad is telling people to go to a book that is false and not the word of God. That would mean that Muhammad was a false prophet. So if so, since Muhammad told people to go to this book, if it is the word of God, then he's a false prophet because his, con his teachings contradict those teachings. If it's not the word of God, then he's a false prophet because he's telling everyone to go to a false corrupt book. So by appealing to the Bible, Muhammad, uh, either way you want to look at it, turns out to be a false prophet. Okay, and uh, Nabil, you want to add something quickly before we get back to Abdul? Yes, just briefly I wanted to add that of those two options, we know which one is the true option. Yes. Muhammad never believed that the Bible was corrupted. Right. Everything that he says indicates that the Bible seems to be, he believed, the true word. Yes. Um, Abdul has mentioned already chapter 5, verse 47 of the Quran. Mm -hmm. uh, we know from Sunan Abu Dawood, mm -hmm. one of the books of Sahih Sitta, mm -hmm. um, number 4464, that Muhammad put his hand on a Torah yeah. and said, I confirm that this is the word of God. 
Sunan Abu Dawood number 4464. Yes. Now, the only indication that the words of the Bible may have been changed according to the Quran comes from the word Baddallah. Mm -hmm. Now, you speak Arabic, I don't. But apparently that means changed or exchanged. Mm. The words were exchanged. Mm. That is the only indication where the words may have been changed. But stronger words have been used in the case of the Quran. Mm. If you actually look at chapter 15, verse 91 of the Quran, uh, it says that the Quran was ripped into shreds. Now, on the one hand, we say that the Bible words were exchanged, but the Quran's words were ripped into shreds according to the Quran itself. Now, you tell me which one seems to be what seems to be being said. If you're saying the the Bible is corrupted just by saying the words badalla, then uh, of course. When the Quran's words have been ripped into shreds, they certainly must have been corrupted. Thank you, Nabil. Now, we're going to get back to Abdu, but I want to remind you this is a live uh, call-in show, and uh, there's some serious things being said here. And uh, this particular, this dilemma that has been brought up in uh, Abdu's uh, testimony and brought up in a scholarly way by Brother David, uh, I would welcome any Muslim who has a reasonable answer to present your evidence right now. Here's your chance to present your evidence in front of millions of people. Dial in 248-416-1300.